Oh, this conference will now be recorded. Web... I might yeah. have to turn off my webcam, but oh well. Uh, it's really great to see everyone. I'm so glad you could join us today. Um, I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development and, and the Division of Library and Information Services. It's great to have you today. We're talking about going fine free. Ooh, wow. Uh, although we're focusing on this topic, I just want you to know that you know these these sessions are for you. So if you have another topic uh, that you would like to also bring up because it's a burning issue for you or your um, you know you, you have something that you want to share with the group and get some feedback on, please feel free to do so. Some libraries and library systems have been fine free for years, some, some even since their inception. Uh, others um, ha, are, are uh, making this decision more recently. And some are, are making this decision now. Uh, we have people on the call, I think, who are, who are trying to figure out whether they want to go fine free and how to approach their governing body with uh, with this idea. Uh, I invite, I think some of you who have been on this call before, I tend to invite uh, staff from other libraries throughout Florida to talk about the topic of the day, mainly because they are the ones on the front line, they know what's going on, and, and I'm sure that they're a lot more uh, interesting to talk to about this particular issue than, than I am. So, uh, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Phyllis Spiler from Alachua County Library District. Phyllis, can we see you? Yes, hey Phyllis. Um, Becky Marsh from Holmes County Public Library and she is here on her day off, oh my gosh, or at least she's closed, I'm not sure if it's her day off, but thank you so much. And Tina Peak from Lake Wales Public Library they're going to talk about their decision-making process, uh, the steps they took to seek approval from whatever governing body they, they answer to, um, concerns about library revenue, and any other issues that you may need to consider when you're thinking about going fine free. So please don't hesitate to ask questions um, or share your experiences with us because that's the point. <laughs> of having this. Um, what I'm going to do is just start with a, a few questions and y'all feel free to jump right in. Um, it, it, I, I'm open to whoever wants to start first. Um, but what I'd like to know in your library is who sort of brought up the topic of going fine free? How did this come up? Uh, who was the champion, if you will, of this process? Becky, you want to tell us? Are you there, Becky? I'm trying to get my mic on. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, at least now I'm working. <laughs> As for our library, when I started eight years ago, we were not charging fines at that time. Uh-huh. So. Uh -huh. So we have continued as a director, I just continued not charging fines. Our area doesn't have a very good revenue. And so not charging fines seems to make it more feasible for a lot of the children and young kids to come in and be able to use the books without having difficulty with parents helping them return them on time. I see. Phyllis, what was your experience? Just trying to figure out how to un unmute myself here. Well, we were being funded in an odd type of way because there was a period of time that the city was being, the city funded library services and the county funded our transit systems. And then they switched over where the county funded the library. Uh, through their they funded the library through their general revenue. And that was becoming one of those things that of how do we, what things can we cut? What things can we look at? So what we decided in about 1978 
I've been with the library probably about a couple of years by then. And we were looking at what did life, we were becoming philosophical, I think, uh, because we were looking at do fines do what they're supposed to do? Fines were designed in order to get the materials back, but even when the materials were brought back, people still had to pay the fines, which was astronomical and also a problem for people uh, trying to get, uh, get library services. So we did a study and we found the fact that we were handling about $13,000 in income from the fines, but it was costing us $21,000 in order to collect the fines. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And so that did not seem to be too good. You're paying more to get for less. Plus, we were alienating the people. Uh huh. Because for a child using the library, and you're five years old, and you go to use the library, and you return your books, but you can only return them when your parents took you to the library to do that. But even when you return them, that fine was still attached, unless their parents could afford to pay the fine the child couldn't get anything out of the library. And the only thing that child remembered was, that's a place that don't let you use their library. And we knew the fact that those were our future taxpayers <laughs> were helped to fund the library. And then of course, we had the other spectrum. We had the elderly who a lot of them, because the books and, you know, that was their way out. That was their entertainment and things. And what was happening to them was the fact that a lot of them were on fixed income. And of course, paying fines was something that they knew they needed to do in order to be able to use the library. That became a problem because a lot of people, and I tell people all the time, a lot of people made decisions that I felt, just my opinion, was not the right decision because then they made a decision about whether to pay the fine or eat. And some of the elderly chose paying the fines rather than eating. And that was not a good thing because those were the people who had paid the taxes and paid the funding that we got in order to operate our libraries. So you had two spectrums. You had your future taxpayers and you had the taxpayers who had been paying and supporting your library. And so at that particular, and plus we were paying more to collect than we actually got. <laughs> Sort of a no <laughs> <laughs> Quite make a whole lot of sense. That coupled with the fact that we realized the fact that because some people, when you had so much fines, you just didn't return the books. It was just cheaper for you in the long run just not to return them. And there were a lot of books we found the fact that we could not replace. So now you have alienation of your public. You had the fact that you were paying more than you were collecting. And then you are not going to be able to replace the items that people kept. So using all of those factors, it seemed cost effective for us not to charge fines. And so we stopped, uh, it's been about 40, 43 years now, because we stopped in 1978 of charging fines. Wow. You, uh, must, have, you must have been a little girl when you started working for Electric County. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were. <laughs> Thank but, you. So uh, we just did away with uh, doing fines. And as far as how it was received, people were, you know, flabbergasted because they would come in and be ready to pay their fines. And then they were just so pleased the fact that this was not happening to them, mm -hmm. that they didn't have to do that. So we, in many ways, we saved money. Now, one of the drawbacks was the fact that the books didn't come back as quickly <laughs> as they would have, or we felt they would have, but the bottom line was we got the books back when before the books weren't coming back. Because like I said, if I had to, I gave you the book, then you tell me I can't check out another book until I pay the fine. And also too, at a point, and many libraries, you know, the fine went up each time. Oh, and a $3.95 paperback, I could be paying $25 in fine for it. Yeah. yeah. And because it wasn't to many years later that a lot of libraries that still charge fines, what they realized they had to put a cap on them. 
Mm -hmm. well, during that time, there wasn't a cat. It just kept going and going and going and going. Oh my goodness, yeah. yeah. And so that's what we did in order to uh, stop doing that. Um, and later we were very fortunate because uh, of not doing that and other factors. And we decided we wanted to be an independent taxing district. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through a lot of different phases of things that we've done because you also asked something about how do we how do we help our revenue? We help our revenue by not doing away with things that were costing us more to get. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're directly on the tax rolls now. And we've been able to expand, added additional libraries because at that time we only had the headquarters and three branches. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you so much. Tina, what can you share with us about your experience? Well, I'm the do kid. <laughs> we, um, we went fine free as of November 1st, 2019. And then we all know what happened in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. So just about the time we were rolling this out and trying to get some public awareness and um, folks understanding it, everything came to a screeching halt. So, um, and it was, you know, people's minds were on other things. I'm sure most everybody who's here are still seeing items that haven't been returned during closure and so forth. But I, Lake Wales is part of a library cooperative. We're not a library system in Polk County. Um, we are all independent municipal public libraries that are bound by our own municipalities, ordinances and so forth. But you ask how, how the idea came about. The Lakeland Public Library Director, Lisa Lilliquist, invited um, about four of us for lunch one day and just said, you know, I really would like to do this. What are, what are your guys' ideas? And we we kicked around the idea. Some, two of the, well, actually, yes, there were four of us. It was Lakeland, Lake Wales, Winter Haven, and Mulberry. Um, I just went ahead and at, left there and took up the question with my city manager and my library board and we moved forward with it and we announced it and I was um, you know they say the best form of flattery is plagiarism I just went out on the web and kind of went to see how other libraries were announcing it and the Denver Public Library System I think had this great video on their website of their mayor telling everybody how we were no longer charged you know, they were no longer charging library fees and so forth but i was able to make my case and i did i did a lot of research and um we actually ran a report that showed how much was owed and i can tell you what we we collected in revenues on an annual basis for overdues was less a right at ten thousand dollars we were owed closer to the seventy nine thousand dollars so it was kind of a no-brainer that people are as phyllis said are are fearful of coming into a building that they have invested in and not for fear that they won't be allowed or you know whatever shame is involved in not paying your bills i think that was one of the things so we um so our fine free is on Lake Wales Public Library materials only. And, and in this cooperative, people can borrow from any library. We have had a second library in Polk County Library Cooperative become fine free this past June, and that's the Mulberry Library. And I see Chris on the call, and um, she is at Bartow Public Library, and they are, they are moving forward um, to their commission to do that. When I took it to the city commission, they said absolutely. Um, so we we wrote policy uh 30 days after the final due date if an item is 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 considered lost if it's still out so that's six weeks of checkout time plus 30 more days then a, an individual gets an invoice but the invoice also states if you return the material you owe nothing so we wiped out all existing fines on lake Wells public library materials and and we wiped out and and then we put set that policy into motion so um 
but at this time we we opened reopened um november 1st of 2020 which is on it was to the day a year later than we had announced time free so we're still i still hear my CERC staff saying, no, we don't charge fines on Lake Wells materials. But I tell you what we did do, because so many people were um, wanting to pay the fine, is we put a Friends of the Library donation bin in the front lobby, and, and they love to give to that, and, and you know, it salves their conscience or whatever. Um, Good. There's just, you know, we all have an expectation of loss in this profession. It's It happens, and um, but it seems to be, uh, it's be, it's very well received in this community. Very happy I did it, or happy my commission and library board allowed me to do it. That's wonderful. Well, I see that uh, Cheryl Morales has joined us from Pinellas. Uh, we're glad to have you, Cheryl. And I, I invited Cheryl so that she could talk to us about their plan to go fine free throughout the Pinellas Cooperative. So Cheryl, t what made y'all decide to go this route? Thanks, Claudia, for having, uh, for inviting me to talk. Um, it, it's been a long road, I have to say, for Pinellas. We are the other, besides Polk County, we're the other single county library cooperative uh, in the state of Florida. So we have 14 municipal members, mm -hmm. and two of the library directors are in the call right now Susan Hurley and Jen Obermeyer. So please, oh. Susan and Jen, if I say anything wrong or if you want to chime in, please do. I would be very happy for that. Um, so the directors pretty much decide the policies on all the circulation rules in the in the libraries. And the directors have been talking about going fine free for over four years now. Um, there's been a lot of research done, a lot of looking at trends from around the country and what's happening and around our local area to see what's happening. Um, when Hillsborough went fine free, um, uh, Andrew Breitenberg went out and, and he did a FLA uh, session on their experiences and published a paper on their experiences. Um, our neighboring counties have all gone fine free, Pasco County, Manatee County, and Citrus County has never had library fines, overdue fines. So we're looking at the country, we're looking at our immediate Tampa Bay area, and, and everyone uh, pretty much decided that this was the way to go. Um, one of our libraries decided they wanted to go fine free way before the library directors made the final decision to do so. Um, but because we're on a shared ILS, they had to do it manually. Mm -hmm. So that was the Gulfport Public Library. They uh, waived all their overdue fines manually. Um, but as of October 1st, all the overdue fines will be turned off. Um, and we do have two libraries that would like to keep overdue fines on certain items, like specialty high cost items. Mm -hmm. So they will be allowed to keep those overdue fines on just those items. But again, they'll have to do that manually as well, because we just have one policy in the ILS and any exceptions to the rules have to be done manually on the individual library level. So um, it's been a very interesting journey and it has been a little bumpy at times, but I think overall everyone is really looking forward to being fine free in October, October 1st, 2021. Awesome. Susan or Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that? This is uh, Jen. No, Cheryl, I think you you hit it, hit it all. You covered it all. <laughs> but I think overall, uh, um, we're all very excited going in this direction. Yeah, we're. I mean, we planned this a while ago, and so we're just kind of waiting right now till October first to institute it. But there is a question in the chat um, from Emily that asked, what are some of the specialty items? And if I remember correctly, it's certain things like the, 
like the pads and the electronics and some of the materials that are I don't remember all the details about what specific items they're charging for, but I know the um if you remember Cheryl, I don't. Yeah, the Wi-Fi hotspots, the there's certain learning kits that they have that are specialty items, but really in truth, every one of our 14 member libraries has specialty items that cost a lot of money. And yeah. books cost a lot of money too. Um, so anyway, the library directors decided to allow that to happen. Um, have an exception to the rule and our our verbiage will be um, that all of our libraries are going overdue fine free um, with a little asterisk in italics at the bottom of that statement saying some libraries may charge overdue fines for certain items mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um, so I I imagine that everyone was doing the same sort of thing that Phyllis was doing and Tina thinking about costs in terms of uh, you know what it costs for you to collect these fines. In your case, Cheryl, I think you, there was sort of peer pressure from the surrounding counties, you know, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. That's uh, funny. But, well, you know, I, I can't imagine that this is not a well-received um, initiative by by the public. But in reality, what what do you do about lost revenue if you are in fact losing revenue? If you aren't, then it's not a big deal. But right. if you are, then what do you do? Well, if you haven't read the Tampa study on Tampa Hillsborough County, Andrew Breidenbaugh talks about gained revenue. Mm -hmm. And even at a county commissioner's meeting where I was recently, um, just before the meeting, and it was a budget hearing, but this fine-free topic came up during our budget hearing. Um, but just before the meeting started, the county administrator was talking about how they were going cashless and how much money the county is saving oh. on being cashless. And so I was able to quote him during the inquisition that was happening later <laughs> on um, during my budget hearing. And I said, even the county realizes that you save money when you eliminate cash from your daily operations. And they found that in Hillsborough County, um, you know, they had to pay an armored car service to go from one library to another on a daily basis to collect the cash. All wow. the um, people involved on the county level um, in Hillsborough County in depositing cash, counting cash, checks, credit cards, however they were receiving payments, all of that went away. So they were able to not fill vacancies when they came open on the library level and on the county level in accounts payable. Mm -hmm. um, so they ended up saving a lot of money and Hillsborough County found that, um, and I don't, I don't wanna speak, if there's anyone here from Hillsborough County, please speak up and tell me I'm wrong um, if I am, but they were finding that people were returning their items before the due date <laughs> and, and the biggest 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 thing of all in in my opinion is that people that were afraid to go to the library were coming back to the libraries yeah. again because they had they had accumulated so much overdue fines that they just couldn't pay them so they just stayed away from the library and when those fines were waived they came back in droves and That's that right. was the thing that really really got to us you know to be able to get people to come back to the library that had uh, negative experiences because of their fine situation and then also encouraging people to come to the libraries and have no fear to come to a library because you weren't going to be charged if you didn't bring something back on the exact date that it was due yeah yeah 
Uh, did you all find this to be true? Becky, I know that you inherited your your uh, the policy and Phyllis, you were there when they implemented yours and Tina too. Did you find that people were more, um, were less afraid, I guess you would say, or less concerned about going in the library? I love the fact that Phyllis said, you know, your tax dollars pay for the library. Uh, you know, I don't really think about that a whole lot, but I'm glad you reminded me of that, Phyllis. So when I go into uh, Leon County Library, they have a an automatic renewal uh, policy, which I love. Um, but, you know, that's done uh, online. And so if you, you know, if you don't have that digital sort of um, capability if you're the, you know the digital divide may cause you to not realize that your your book is going to be renewed i don't know but i love that feature uh and so uh well one of one of the things that i found is i started having one of my staff members just before she would go home she would call them and say we just wanted to let you know that next week your items are due and if they had something overdue, she would call them and say, we just wanted to remind you that it's past due. And if you'll just swing by and drop it in our Dropbox, we'll get it checked in for you. Or we can turn around and check it out for a few more weeks for you if you're not finished reading it. Uh -huh. Well, our response from that caused a great de decrease in the amount of items we were not getting back. Um, because she started that, we had some items that were due back in October, like three and four months ago, that started getting returned. They were getting returned in our Dropbox, but they were getting returned. And it for us, we have, we just don't have a big um, problem with individuals not returning books. Most of what I found are children or YA books that wind up being not returned on time. And when we call them and let them know, then the parents are usually, oh, I forgot all about that. And within a couple of weeks, we get them. Yeah. So we have a few that's just regular. I'm going to be late. It don't matter yeah. what. <laughs> but they're really good because we don't charge a fine that they return the books or the items. And luckily, if they have one that comes back that the child is damaged, they're willing to go ahead and pay for it because they want to bring that child to get more items. Mm -hmm. So with us, it's it's been a blessing mm -hmm. not to have the fines because we do keep a bigger response of patrons coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for us. Oh. Go ahead, Phyllis. Okay, for us, because we started it so long ago, so when we added on eight more branches, it was already in place uh, and we did we started doing something what you were talking about becky what we don't call we don't call them but what we did we do send out notices because people do forget what they've got but also too we started doing because now everything is technology driven and so we automatically renew things for people that way they don't have to worry about it and up to the limits because we've got what two renewals after you first check out you can renew things for twice unless there's somebody else waiting for it and that mm -hmm. was another thing even when we sent those notices we did it because we knew that people were waiting for those particular items and we send them notices and let them know that they have those would they please return them so that the next person can get them i will tell you our we're lucky in that fees and so forth do not go into general revenue for don't go into the general revenue fund we have our own line revenues for certain things and it includes what we call fees now um, so i'm able to actually deposit anything that does come in as far as lost material or other the with polk county library cooperative as i said right now there's only two libraries and a possible third one who will have no fines on their materials. I really don't see a day when all 16 locations are fine free because there are some library directors, I don't think just their personal um, beliefs are that there should be some kind of accountability. Um, 
when we were closed, we continued to do door side service like everybody did. Um, and now we've got a whole new revenue stream in um, copies, faxes, printing that people found convenient to stop by here. Sadly, one of our one of the last local printers we had in Lake Wales um, went out of business due to the pandemic. So mm -hmm. right now, a lot of the people who have asked me, what do you, do you, do you have numbers yet? I, I don't even think numbers would be valid after um, nine months of closure after the um, fine free went into effect. But right now I'm ahead of where I was any year in the past. So it's not, obviously people are coming in, they're using services and they're paying fees when they, when they're applicable. So we, we're doing better revenue wise, even without the fines um, accruing. So I keep saying, we'll look at it in October one and see how we went did for a year um, because 2020 was not the year to gauge the success or failure of this. <laughs> I see. Interesting. If you have questions for these folks, please speak up. Um, they they will be able to answer you and and give you some ideas on how to to uh, you know handle the process. I, I have have any of you ever received any pushback from your um, local government or whomever for wanting to go fine free? My library board is appointed by the commission and they are a policy making board. And, and there, there was at least one and possibly two who really believed in the accountability that money provided to people. And um, I did a lot of research. In fact, if anybody would like me to send you, I've got a whole file folder on my desktop of nice. find free information from around the county, um, including Andrew. Andrew's information was a huge help to me. Um, but they they were uh, willing to be swayed and said, can we look at it and again in a year? And I said, well, if you take away fines, you can't put them back in, because talk about <laughs> talk about that. Oh, we were just kidding. Uh, Putting just, the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, no. <laughs> went all the way or pull it back. So they decided to go in all the way. And the commission never asked a single question. They just approved it. So. Huh. Good for, good for their votes, huh? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, did, the, did any of these administrators have any questions at all? Uh, did anyone, you know, come to you and say, I'm, I'm concerned about, or, or even just in these publicly noticed, I'm assuming these are publicly noticed meetings, um, say, you know, can you show us evidence of this not being, um, an adverse policy in terms of getting materials back, or I certainly understand having a fine on a high dollar item. I mean, I think that most libraries put even really expensive books that are irreplaceable uh, behind, you know, in reserve so that people cannot check them out and then say they lost them. Um, I know that there was a, an incident not too long ago about the Dr. Seuss books that, uh, you know, people were going around and checking out the Dr. Seuss books and then, uh, you know, saying they were lost when in fact they were probably just being sold, you know, wherever they sell those kinds of things. Uh, that's really unfortunate because that, you know, they, they set the tone for everybody else who wants to use those books and check them out. But Regardless, um, so we talked about library usage increase. That's always a plus. Uh, I can't even imagine someone not wanting to go back into the library, even if they owe a fine. Uh, I don't know, begging is always a good thing if you're young and, and poor. <laughs> uh, um, I lived in a county one time in, a, in a, uh, an impoverished state in the South that um, the town was very small and uh, I, I always use the public library no matter where I live. So this, I went into the public library 
and checked out some books and then I think one or two were overdue or whatever. They charge a quarter a day. And if you owed more than a dollar, you could not recheck your book or check out any books. And I said, oh my gosh, you, you know, how are little children? <laughs> what are they doing? You know, what are, what are children doing? I, can I just pay somebody's fee for them so that they can have access to books? It's incredible. I don't, I don't understand it, but uh, have there been any downsides to this policy? I can't think of any other than then sometimes in my situation there is confusion over when somebody brings back five items three of which are lake whales and two of which are another polk county library cooperatives and we say well you don't owe anything over here but you owe two dollars here mm -hmm. uh, because i can't we can't not collect other libraries fines if they want to keep them in place as um but with transview we don't we don't trade off each other's fines. If if somebody pays a fine here, then we keep the money. If somebody pay, nobody charges for our books anyplace else or movies. So, but it, most people are pleasantly surprised. So you don't have to return that money to your. No, we just again. Cheryl said something about going cashless. We have five day a week delivery between sixteen locations, and to ask those gentlemen to transport cash across the county we just said we'll do it on the honor system and that's it and and we also give them the option of you know here's the library's address if you'd like to send them a check or whatever so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't we didn't have we didn't it, it wasn't a problem for us but to some of the surrounding areas it was concerned the fact that they say things like you know People like to go on over to your library because they and they quickly tell us that you all don't ch charge fines and they want us to charge fine, not charge fines. And that just, but then of course they also tell us that personally they do come over to our library themselves to check out books because we don't charge fines. But that was just, <laughs> <laughs> that was the only thing. It wasn't so much a problem for us as you know, there was just concern about others that, you know, we're, we are able to do something that they can't do. Well, some library systems have, um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about Florida necessarily, but they'll have like a fine free week or a fine free day or something like that. And I have no idea how successful that approach is, um, whether people just hang on to their books until, until that fine free day or week or whatever comes up, but even academic. I can tell you they do. We, we ran um, here <laughs> from November 1st to December 31st every year, we did food for fines. And we pretty much two times a week had to call the charity the food was going to, to come pick up the big, huge barrels to pick them up because people will ask, when is fine free week? You know, when is food for fines? So um, yeah, we just, and we allowed them to pay for existing fines with food too, but we just now stick those barrels out and ask people to donate to them on, uh, during the holidays anyway. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Do others do who don't have fine free right now, do you do things like that? Have you experimented with anything? Lena said no. And Lena, what library are you with? Oh, South Florida, okay, South Florida State College. Anybody else have an idea on how to, to make, you know, keep that in place, but also make it, uh, less onerous, I guess, for the people who are checking it out, checking them out. Lena said, I've been looking into fine free and then the bu budget tanked. She's going to revisit, yeah, that process, yeah. 
I think that that uh, information that Tina has collected might be helpful to you, Lena. I went by a bank this week and I knew the person that was waiting on me and she very sheepishly handed me a children's book across the counter and she said, I've been waiting for you to come in. My daughter cleaned her room out. And um, I had this brilliant idea and I came back and told my youth services staff, I said, next summer we're going to do a clean your room up, clean your room up week. And if you find library materials, you'll it'd be entered into a drawing for an Amazon card. So, <laughs> Maybe the kids to clean their room out and they can find their mater lost materials. I wish I'd had that when my son was little. <laughs> uh, Lena says, Andrew's presentation at FLA several years is, ago is what got me started on this. So that's wonderful. Does anyone have any questions about uh, going find free, you know, what is the process or how did you do it? This sort of leads into another conversation too about library revenue. Um, Phyllis, I think you're, you're uh, lucky in that you're in that you are in a special tax district. Um, most of us are not in that position. Uh, and there are other things, I mean, I can remember at FLA a couple of years ago, the uh, presentation on passports and how that was a very, uh, I don't want to say lucrative, but uh, a, a way to generate uh, revenue for that particular library. And I'm sorry, I don't remember which library it was. Um, but if revenue is of concern, what kinds of things are you doing? Uh, if you feel like that is a an important component for your library's budget, especially now. We offered we offered notary service for a while, and then I realized that the one notary we had notary public we had at the front desk was no longer checking materials in and out. There was always a line in front of her for notary services. Wow. And it, it was time consuming. And I also overheard her ask a gentleman, um, well, who's signing this? And my mother and well, she's got to be here to sign it. And he said, well, she's dead. So <laughs> I was like, this is, this service is going away. So that was something I, I made the decision we didn't need that revenue as much as, even oh though it was goodness. a pretty lucrative business, but. It was pretty lucrative. Now we, yeah, now at our Holmes County Library, we um, scan items and email them. A lot of individuals need something put in a scan so that they can email it to their doctor's office or lawyer or whatever. We charge for scanning and emailing. We charge for faxes. We offer a notary service. We've been offering notary service for eight years, but we offer it for free with the option of giving a donation to the library. But that's just because I've been a notary since 87. And so I do that. I It's something that I had that I just offered to the library for free since I was employed there. Mm -hmm. But I maintain my notary seal and being bonded. We don't charge. We just tell them if they want to donate to the library, they can, but we don't charge for the notary service. Um, I've been doing it long enough that I know what I will and won't agree with. And everybody in town's pretty much figured out that I'm pretty tight on that. Our banks are no longer doing notary service. Hmm. So as of right now, this library and our courthouse are the only two people that do notary service for our for our county. Wow. The other options are going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So those are some ways that we're bringing in revenue. That's a good idea. Especially a service that you have to have in your community. Um, it's amazing. 
Emily says, Becky, I know I'd much rather go to the library than the courthouse. <laughs> I guess it depends on the parking. Just saying. Anybody else have any ideas about, uh, you know, maybe that isn't something that's uppermost on your in your minds now, uh, collecting revenue. Um, I mean, I think even for academic libraries, you know, they're, uh, the deans or directors of those libraries are, are charged to raise money. Uh, and that is something that most of us were not trained to do when we were in library school. Um, I don't know that uh, they do, they teach that now. If we have any younger people on the call, um, do, are they teaching those kinds of things in library school? Um, Darlene said that they're doing room rentals. That's great. How many rooms do you have in your library, Darlene, that y'all can rent out? We have a, a community, so we have a, six branches in our system and each branch has a community room and um, like a smaller, like half the size of a community room. And our largest community room has a capacity of uh, 250 seats with a wow. stage. That's big. So we'll get like dance studios and, you know, obviously non library um, events will yeah. take place and they rent the room out. So your policy generally says, you know, this is, this is use is free whereas this use is not free so nonprofits get uh, a discount and then if they're not a nonprofit they pay the full price mm -hmm. interesting anybody Just, else could i ask something claudia uh darlene about how much is the cost uh that you charge them or do it depends on the room size, but it's anywhere from twenty-five to a hundred dollars an hour. Okay. We we rent our meeting room, which is about a classroom size, to for profits, but it falls under our recreation facilities usage, and they set the rates for us. So. It's just like if you wanted to rent the community center for a wedding reception, the library's meeting room is also offered um, to for profits. We don't charge for nonprofits. And they adjust that cost, I think, upwards 3%. And we also, Darlene, I don't know if you have to do this, but we, we have to pay sales tax on those rental revenues. Wow. You too. Mm -hmm. hmm. oh, I shouldn't say we we as the library pay it but we oh, we, my, we we have to charge and then the city pays the sales tax for us but we oh. have to factor in a seven percent sales tax fixed on the room rentals mm. does anyone have anything else you'd like to share about uh revenue or um fine going fine free Well, I, I, I'm going to give you how many minutes back? Nine minutes back in your day. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us, and particularly uh, Tina, Cheryl, Becky, and uh, Phyllis, and let's see, I think it was Susan and Jen who also came in. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions for these folks, I'm sure they'd be happy to you know, give you any support, uh, guidance that they can provide to you. Um, whatever we can do to help you too. We'll, we're, we're, the BLD is happy to um, uh, support you in any way we can. Uh, if it's just gathering information or pointing you to the right person, we'll do our best. Um, I would like to mention again that this uh, recording will be available on our BLD uh, YouTube channel. So if you have other people who are interested in listening or if y'all just 
think, oh, I got to go back and listen to that one section, um, please do so. Uh, I wanted to also let people know that we're going to be starting a registration process for the DLIS discussions for, for various reasons. Um, that will start in August. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to register ahead of time. You can just join us when, when we go live. <laughs> it just means that you have to, to register so we, so we have that information, but there is no cutoff time. Our next meeting is August the 16th at three o'clock Eastern time. And uh, I have not, uh, uh, I do actually have a topic. We're going to be talking about hot spots. Um, that's a very hot <laughs> issue right now, uh, particularly with the funding that's available through the, floor, uh, the FCC. Um, Emily Hart will be with us to help uh, field any questions you might have, but we're also going to be talking with people who are, you know, have been purchasing hot spots and other um, mechanisms for uh, supporting their community's need for uh, connection, particularly as they've been, uh, you know, doing education um, classes and so on remotely. And I, I'm sure that's going to change some this, this fall, but there's still going to be a lot of people who are at home or who just live in an area where there's not much bandwidth. Um, so I hope you'll join us then. Uh, be happy, be healthy, stay safe, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.